Here are my answers to the 2020-2021 bar examination questions in criminal law. First, the disclaimer. This is just my personal attempt to answer the 2020-2021 bar examination questions in criminal law. I do not seek to supplant nor contradict what the bar examiner in criminal law has in mind with respect to what should be the answers to his questions. And I am not presenting myself as an expert in this field but merely to share my knowledge of criminal law, drawing from my experience as a prosecutor for the last 12 years. Thank you. Question number one. Interviewed for a newspaper, a former beauty queen revealed that when she was 16 years old, she had her first sexual intercourse with her ex-boyfriend, who was then 28 years old. In her narration, she said that she did not know what she was doing and noted that her ex-boyfriend of a more advanced age misled her to doing what he wanted. She added that at certain points during the encounter, she repeatedly said no, but her ex-boyfriend was just too strong for her. The ex-boyfriend left her shortly thereafter. Was there a crime committed by the ex-boyfriend? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes. Section 5B of RA 7610 or the Anti-Child Abuse Law punishes a person who, through coercion, intimidation, or influence, engages in sexual intercourse or lascivious conduct not only with a child exploited in prostitution, but also with a child subjected to other sexual abuse. In the instant case, the former beauty queen, who was then 16 years old, was clearly influenced into having sexual intercourse with her ex-boyfriend when the latter misled her into doing what he wanted. She was likewise coerced by her ex-boyfriend to have sex with him even after she had repeatedly said no. Hence, the crime committed by the ex-boyfriend is sexual abuse under Section 5B of RA 7610. Now, my alternative answer is that the crime committed could also be rape under Article 266-A, Paragraph 1A. That is, the offender had carnal knowledge of her through force and intimidation. At a tender age of 16, the victim was no match to her ex-boyfriend. The latter's sheer force and strength would have easily overcome any resistance that the victim could have put up. Question number two. While executing a search warrant, a police officer pocketed and absconded with the mobile phone of the occupant of the premises being searched. The mobile phone was not the subject of the search warrant. It was not enumerated in the order. Did the police officer commit a crime? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes the police officer committed two crimes. All the elements of theft under Article 308 of the Revised Penal Code are present in that he took the mobile phone of the occupant without his consent and with intent to gain. Intent to gain is presumed from his unlawful taking of personal property belonging to another as shown by his act of pocketing and absconding with the said mobile phone. It is not necessary that there be actual or real gain or that there be proof that he derived some benefit from it. It is enough that he was actuated by the desire or intent to gain. The police officer likewise committed the crime of abuse in the service of search warrants legally obtained under Article 129 of the Revised Penal Code. All the elements of the said crime are present 
in that letter A, the offender is a public officer or employee. Letter B, he has legally procured a search warrant. And letter C, he exceeded his authority in executing the same by his act of taking the mobile phone which was not the subject of the search warrant. Now, why am I saying that the police officer committed two crimes? Theft under Article 308 and abuse in the service of search warrants under Article 129. This is so because of the use of the phrase in addition to the liability attaching to the offender for the commission of any other offense in Article 129 of the RPC, which means that the violation in Article 129 will remain to be a separate felony despite the commission of any other offense during the service of the search warrant. Question number three. The accused in a pending case forcibly snatched the daughter of a judge and kept her in an undisclosed location. The accused then called to tell the judge that the daughter would only be released if the judge would acquit the accused in the pending case. Did the accused commit a crime with these acts? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes. Any private individual who kidnaps or illegally detains a woman or in any manner deprives her of her liberty is liable for the crime of kidnapping and serious illegal detention under Article 267 of the Revised Penal Code. In the instant case, the act of the accused in forcibly snatching the daughter of a judge and keeping her in an undisclosed location resulted in the deprivation of her liberty, an essential element or act which makes the offense of kidnapping. The purpose of the kidnapping is immaterial when any of the circumstances in the first paragraph of Article 267 is present, i.e. that the person kidnapped is a female. Hence, the accused committed the crime of kidnapping and serious illegal detention. Question number four. One afternoon, while standing at the corner of C.P. Garcia and Katipunan Avenues, an off-duty police officer accosted a motorcycle rider and asked him to alight. The off-duty police officer then inspected the motorcycle's compartment box. Pretending that a sachet of shabu was found, the off-duty police officer demanded 1,000 pesos in order to prevent an arrest. Fearful of being incarcerated for life for a crime that was not really committed, the motorcycle rider readily complied. Unknown to the off-duty police officer, a surveillance camera caught the entire incident. Will a charge of robbery prosper against the off-duty police officer? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes. The elements of robbery as defined in Article 293 of the Revised Penal Code are the following. Letter A, that there is personal property belonging to another. Letter B, that there is unlawful taking of that property. Letter C, that the taking is with intent to gain. And letter D, that there is violence against or intimidation of persons or force upon things. In the instant case, there is no question that the 1,000 pesos is personal property that belonged to the motorcycle rider. Second, there was unlawful taking of his money by the off-duty police officer because the taking was without his consent. Or at the very least, his consent was vitiated by his fear of being arrested for a crime he did not really commit. Third, intent to gain is presumed from the off-duty police officer's unlawful act of extorting and taking the money belonging to the motorcycle rider. And fourth, the said police officer employed intimidation 
when he threatened to arrest the motorcycle rider if he would not give in to his demand. Hence, the charge of robbery with violence against or intimidation of persons will prosper against the off-duty police officer. Question number five. To motivate their eight-year-old daughter to study well and have a better future, her parents resorted to making her kneel on rice, spread on the floor, spanking her with a bamboo stick, or requiring her to stand in the rain for hours if her grades fell below 80 in any subject. Did the parents commit a crime? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes. The rules and regulations on the reporting and investigation of child abuse cases in relation to Section 10A of RA 7610 state that Discipline administered by a parent or legal guardian to a child does not constitute cruelty provided it is reasonable in manner and moderate in degree and does not constitute physical or psychological injury as defined herein. In the instant case, although the parents could duly discipline their 8-year-old daughter, making her kneel on rice, or spanking her with a bamboo stick, or requiring her to stand in the rain for hours if her grades fell below 80 in any subject are unnecessary, unreasonable, and excessive. It constitutes cruelty that debases, degrades, or demeans the intrinsic worth and dignity of the child as a human being. Thus, the parents should be held liable for child cruelty under Section 10A of RA 7610 or the Anti-Child Abuse Law. Question number six. An estranged married couple decided to separate. As part of their amicable settlement, they agreed to ask their 14-year-old child to choose a parent with whom to live. The child chose the mother. Displeased, the husband ceased providing for the child's tuition and the wife's support. The husband was a vice president of a highly profitable company. Did the husband commit any crime? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes. Depriving or threatening to deprive the woman or her child of financial support legally due them for the purpose or effect of controlling or restricting the woman's or her child's movement or conduct constitutes economic abuse under Section 5E of RA 9262. In the instant case, although the husband was gainfully employed, he deliberately refused to provide financial support to his wife and their child after the latter chose to live with his or her mother. Evidently, the denial of financial support was designed to subjugate his wife's will and control her conduct in order to pressure her to give up the custody of the child. Hence, the husband here committed the crime of economic abuse under Section 5E of RA 9262. Question number seven. The head of a big company's human resources division copied and shared an employee's physical and email address, birth date, civil status, and some photos with a friend who found the employee attractive. Did the head of the human resources division commit a crime? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes. The Data Privacy Act of 2012 punishes any personal information controller or personal information processor or any of its officials, employees, or agents who discloses to a third party personal information without the consent of the data subject. 
in the instant case, the head of the Human Resources Division as an official in the said division that controls the collection, holding, processing, or use of personal information in the company made an unauthorized disclosure of an employee's personal information to his or her friend without the said employee's consent? This is so regardless of the motive in sharing the personal information. Hence, the head of the Human Resources Division is liable for the crime of unauthorized disclosure under Section 32 of the Data Privacy Act. Question number 8. While a person was passing through a construction site for a new Hall of Justice building, construction workers shouted, Hoy bakla! Halika rito at haplusin mo ko! Hoy bakla! Ang pangit mo! Bakla! Mukha ka pa rin lalaki kahit anong gawin mo! The person victimized by these remarks asks you, was a crime committed by the workers who shouted these statements? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes. Under the Safe Spaces Act, gender-based sexual harassment includes catcalling, homophobic and sexist slurs, persistent uninvited comments or gestures on a person's appearance, and verbal or physical advances which are unwanted and which threaten one's sense of personal space. They are committed in public spaces such as alleys, roads, sidewalks, parks, in government offices, or even in privately owned places open to the public. In the instant case, the remarks made by the construction workers were clearly homophobic, that is, they showed a dislike of or prejudice against gay people. Such slurs, regardless of the motive of the offender, threaten the gay person's sense of personal space, which makes the construction workers liable for the crime of gender-based sexual harassment under the Safe Spaces Act. Question number nine. During one of their intense operational meetings, the campaign manager of a presidential candidate openly suggested, Dapat ipapatay na lang natin ang mga bumabatiko sa kandidato natin. Later, the campaign manager was charged with a crime of proposal to commit murder. Can the campaign manager be convicted of the offense charged? Explain briefly. My answer? No, the campaign manager cannot be convicted of the offense charged. Under Article 8 of the Revised Penal Code, the mere proposal to commit a felony is punishable only in the cases in which the law specially provides a penalty therefore. In the instant case, the proposal to commit murder is not punishable because there is no law that penalizes the same. There is no crime when there is no law that defines and punishes it. Question number 10. During a Senate hearing in aid of legislation, a senator's staff member took a resource person's mobile phone without his consent or knowledge. While the hearing was ongoing, the staff member read the resource person's messages contained in the mobile phone and hurriedly wrote notes which were passed to the senator. Thereafter, the staff surreptitiously returned the mobile phone. The resource person would not have noticed that the mobile phone was taken had it not been for a TikTok video posted by a journalist who was present during the hearing. The TikTok video caught the entire act of the senator's staff member. The TikTok video even had accompanying music and narration. The video became viral. Can the staff member be held liable for theft of the mobile phone? Explain briefly. 
My answer? Yes, the staff member can be held liable for theft of the mobile phone. Theft is consummated when three elements concur. Letter A, the actual act of taking without the use of violence, intimidation, or force upon persons or things. Letter B, intent to gain on the part of the taker. And letter C, the absence of the owner's consent. In the instant case, there was actual taking when the senator's staff member was able to take the resource person's mobile phone without using violence, intimidation, or force upon things. That taking was with intent to gain because intent to gain is already presumed from the unlawful taking of the personal property belonging to another. His mere use of the thing which was taken without the owner's consent constitutes gain. It is immaterial that the staff member later on returned the mobile phone to its owner, for the theft here had already been consummated. Question number 11. In an act of rage while playing golf, a high-ranking public official hit a caddy with a golf club at hole number 9 of a golf course. The caddy fell and died immediately. The public official called a loyal security guard who did not witness the incident. The security guard was instructed to put the caddy's lifeless body in the golf cart and dump it in the nearby lake. The public official wanted to make it appear that the caddy died of drowning. The corpus delicti of the crime was discovered, but the high-ranking public official and the security guard were charged as co-conspirators for the crime of homicide. Can the security guard be convicted as a principal to the crime of homicide? Explain briefly. My answer? No, the security guard cannot be convicted as a principal to the crime of homicide. There was neither express nor implied conspiracy. There is no express conspiracy because the facts do not show that the high-ranking public official and the security guard agreed and decided to kill the caddy. There is likewise no implied conspiracy because the security guard was neither present nor did he participate in the killing of the caddy. The security guard cannot also be liable as a principal by indispensable cooperation because his cooperation came only after the crime had been committed. The security guard, however, can be convicted as an accessory. Having knowledge of the crime, he took part subsequent to its commission by dumping the cadaver in a nearby lake in order to prevent its discovery. Question number 12. A crime defined in the Revised Penal Code is punishable by arresto minor. Finding the accused guilty beyond reasonable doubt of the crime, should the judge apply the indeterminate sentence law? Explain briefly. My answer? No, the judge should not apply the indeterminate sentence law. Section 2 of the said law provides that the same shall not apply to persons convicted of offenses whose maximum term of imprisonment does not exceed one year. In the instant case, the crime for which the accused was found guilty is punishable by arresto minor, which has a duration of only 30 days. Hence, the judge cannot apply the indeterminate sentence law. Question number 13. A prisoner who had been convicted but whose appeal is pending died due to complications caused by COVID-19. Should the prisoner's pending appeal be dismissed as a consequence? Explain briefly. My answer? Yes, the pending appeal should be dismissed. The death of a convict extinguishes his criminal liability at any stage of the proceeding. 
The reason is that if death occurs, there will be no one to serve the penalty for the crime. And since his death occurred before final judgment, his civil liability shall likewise be extinguished. There is no more reason, therefore, to continue with the appeal. Question number 14. A person arrested for playing Kara E. Cruz was charged with violation of Presidential Decree Number 1602 or the Anti-Gambling Law. The lawyer for the accused argues that the case should be dismissed based on an exempting circumstance, which is that the accused is poor. The lawyer argues that unlike those who gamble in big casinos with astronomical sums of money, Kara E. Cruz is the accused's only means of entertainment. In addition, the lawyer explains that gamblers from China, where gambling is illegal, are even welcomed in the Philippines. Is the lawyer's argument legally tenable? Explain briefly. My answer? No, the lawyer's argument is not legally tenable. The case cannot be dismissed on the ground of poverty because poverty is not among the exempting circumstances in Article 12 of the Revised Penal Code. While extreme poverty may be considered as a mitigating circumstance analogous to the incomplete justifying circumstance of state of necessity under Paragraph 1 of Article 13, it may mitigate a crime against property such as theft but not for a violation of the anti-gambling law. Question number 15. While attending to an enhanced community quarantine barangay checkpoint, a barangay tanod confronted a resident for non-essential travel. Infuriated by the barangay tanod's tone, the resident punched the tanod's head. The barangay tanod fell, sustained brain hemorrhage, and died as a result. Charged with homicide, the resident denies liability, arguing that there can be no conviction if there is no intent to cause the barangay tanod's death. Is the resident's defense tenable? Explain briefly. My answer? No, the resident's defense is not tenable. Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the Revised Penal Code states that criminal liability shall be incurred by any person committing a felony, although the wrongful act done be different from that which he intended. In the instant case, while it is true that the resident intended only to punch the barangay tanod, he will still be liable for the consequence of his felonious act, i.e., the death of the barangay tanod, even if he had no intention to commit so grave a wrong as that committed. The resident, therefore, should still be convicted of homicide, but the mitigating circumstance of praeter intentionem should be appreciated in his favor. <laughs> 